getting the signal now. <laughs> stability and maneuverability. So you can measure their bipeds, you can measure kinematics, kinetics. As Steve showed, you can, you can really understand uh, uh, what's happening at the musculoskeletal and bone level. So, uh, thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction. I'm yep. sorry about the delay. Is this an appropriate volume? Okay. Um, first, I want to thank the organizers for bringing us all together in, in such a nice place. I look, really look forward to the discussion this week. I always really enjoy dynamic walking for the, the in-depth discussions. So what I wanted to try to do today was summarize some of the observations we've made over the past few years from experimental data on ground birds running over various terrain conditions on how they actually control their legs to move over uneven terrain. And I just want to start by, with a caveat, after the really nice talks on some of the detailed three-dimensional kinematics, the approach I'm going to be taking today is much more simplified. And that isn't to say that these 3D motions aren't important, but the, the first step that I wanted to take in understanding locomotion and uneven terrain is to look at the overall um, whole body dynamics in uneven terrain, and the leg kinematics from a very simplified point of view is leg angular traje trajectories and leg length trajectories. So we won't, I won't be going into detailed joint kinematics here today. I also want to right up front acknowledge the contributions of, of the research team at the Royal Veterinary College. Um, I have uh, less and less time to actually spend in the lab, and collecting experimental data is always an extensive team effort. You can develop sometimes develop simulations of locomotion alone on your laptop, but um, collecting data always takes uh, about five or six people just for one, for one experiment. So it's always a team effort, and I want to particularly acknowledge uh, the work by my PhD student, Ola Byrne Jeffrey, who's not at this conference because she's busy finishing writing up her thesis, um, but I've drawn a lot on her PhD work in, in today's talk. And I also have um, Yvonne Bloom and Simon Wilson starred there. I don't, didn't have pictures handy, so I showed um, images of their study animals here. Um, <laughs> Yvonne has been working on guinea fowl locomotion, and Simon is uh, looking at uh, turkey gates and looking at how, how turkeys transition between gates, and I hope you'll go see their posters um, later in the conference. So I will have to buy like So I also want to just up front say, while I find, uh, I find robotics fascinating for the, the, to, in their ability to demonstrate locomotion principles, what really motivates me is the biology. I'm really interested in understanding animal locomotion from the perspective of understanding the, the co-evolution of morphology and animal behavior. And I use birds as a model system because they're convenient in a number of respects. That This has already um, been discussed a little bit today because this, this whole session is on ground birds. Um, they're, they're bipedal, they use striding bipedal gates that are similar to humans, but they also use a, a range of in gates that, that are a little bit different from what humans do. Walking and running are very distinct in humans, but there's kind of a gradation of grounded running and weird intermediate gates that birds exhibit. So they're, they're fascinating in that regard. They are capable runners, and they also span a 500-fold size range from very tiny quail like the Japanese quail, um, the smallest animal we've studied is the bobwhite quail, which is about 250 grams, and then all the way up to ostriches, which are get up to 120 kilograms. But most, much of the work that I'll talk about today has been on the guinea fowl, which is a, a useful model system because of its size, it's convenient to handle, it runs very well, it's easy to train and motivate without um, too much trouble in the lab. So many of the studies are on guinea fowl only, but then we do have some comparative work 
spanning um, bobwhite quail up to ostriches that I'll talk about briefly. So I'm interested in, in the general broad question of how animals achieve versatile and stable locomotion in complex environments, and that's a very vague statement because, um, well, we don't really understand how animals move through complex environments exactly. And with, with modern tools, with you know, sensors that we can attach directly on animals moving through natural environments, we're getting um, more detailed knowledge um, very rapidly now. But we don't really understand how animals move through uneven terrain, when they turn around an obstacle or go over it. And so it's, it's a big problem that we're really just starting to get a handle on. So you know, the, the, we have to study it mostly in a laboratory setting where we have to use some sort of controlled setup to and choose a particular perturbation type. So what this means is that we have some observations on a limited number of different terrain perturbations. And what I'll do today is try to just give you an overview of what things that we've observed have remained relatively consistent across these terrain perturbations, but also acknowledging that um, our knowledge is still relatively limited. So the approach that I use overall is combines a number of different experimental techniques we measure whole body dynamics uh, and, you know, from the perspective of very simplified models like the mass spring model, measuring just the ground reaction forces and the center of mass motions of, of the body. Um, and we measure leg dynamics, sometimes from a detailed joint perspective, but often just from the simple perspective of a virtual leg connecting the center of mass to the toe. Um, and then I also am interested in neuromuscular function, so we do make direct recordings of muscle activation patterns during locomotion, but I won't be talking about that today. So today I'll be just focusing on um, how animals negotiate some specific types of terrain perturbations and how their whole body dynamics uh, change during these um, perturbations. So one observation from the literature on animal locomotion is that all terrestrial animals that have been observed no matter their size, their number of legs, their morphology, tend to run in a similar, in a dynamically similar way that can be modeled using a mass spring model. So it's just a very simplified, a simple balancing motion. And basically you can um, replicate approximately the ground reaction forces with, um, by adjusting parameters like the, the leg length, the contact angle, and the springs, effective spring stiffness um, of this model. But that only tells us a limited amount about how animals move, because you can, you can bounce along like a, a mass spring system in many different ways. And so one observation, for example, is that small animals tend to use very compliant gates, whereas large animals tend to use very relatively stiff gates. So if you model them with a mass spring model, what you get is for small animals uh, with very compliant gates, long stance durations with lower peak forces, and um, larger, Forast fluctuations um, in mechanical energy during stance and short aerial phases, whereas large animals like an ostrich use relatively stiff limbs, they bounce a little higher, and they have longer aerial phases. So we're trying to understand what factors influence how animals move in sort of this broad perspective of how do you choose to bounce along with a relatively compliant leg or relatively stiff leg, and what uh, swing leg trajectories do you use to control your stance, dynamics, your stance dynam dynamics. And there are many possible factors, and we're really just trying to, starting to get an understanding of some of these factors. Of course, minimization of energy cost is one that seems to be a universal principle for animal locomotion. But there are also other factors, such as stability. But then we have the trouble of defining what stability means for an animal. So that's not actually very clear. We don't know if animals care about maintaining perfectly steady state lo locomotion. In fact, we have lots of evidence to suggest that they don't. Um, robustness or the maximum perturbations that they can negotiate without falling might be a factor. And also avoidance of limits like force limits or power limits may be factors. So now I'm just gonna talk about some specific perturbation types and then and the observations that we, we've gained from those. The first perturbation that I, I did was part of my PhD thesis many years ago now was an unexpected pothole perturbation where the, there was a drop that was about 40% of the animal's leg length and this drop was camouflaged by tissue paper across the gap because what we were interested in is understanding the intrinsic mechanical response if the animal was not able to anticipate 
the perturbation, um, was it able to maintain stability in the sense of at least not falling? And, and how did it do that and how did the dynamics change? So what we observed, this is a video. Most people here have probably seen this before at other dynamic walking conferences, but I always like to look at it again. Um, basically, this is the bird you can see running over that gap. It places its foot on the tissue paper as if it's the ground level, but it breaks through, and what you can see is its stance um, phase in the pothole. It has a much more extended leg. It's been retracted backwards, so it's at a different angle. And what happens there is it accelerates forward during that drop step and then converting potential energy to kinetic energy, and then it's converted back from kinetic energy to potential energy on the step up. So we can model the forces based using a slip model, is, and the, the only thing we really have to change to, uh, to model the ground reaction forces during that drop step is change the contact angle. So the bird retracted its leg backwards, and it has an, a different contact angle, and this results in an asymmetric stance phase, which accelerates it forward. But, but note that the peak forces are relatively similar between the level step and the drop step, even though this is a, a large drop of 40% of the leg length, so you might expect some change in the forces. The next study I did was to put obstacles on a treadmill where the animal can encounter the same uh, terrain perturbation over and over again. And the question here, this allowed us to get a lot more data because you can only surprise an animal with a pothole so many times before it starts to wise up. So we put it on a treadmill and we, from the animal's perspective, the, the obstacles are black, so they can't, there's not a lot of visual contrast. And they're coming at the, the bird very rapidly. So it has to rapidly negotiate the obstacles. And we were wondering whether there are stride-to-stride -stride adjustments that they make in order to do this. So this is a video of a guinea fowl negotiating obstacles on this treadmill. And what we found when we looked both at the kinematics and, and also muscle activation patterns is that there really aren't many stride-to-stride -stride adjustments. The kinematics of all steps except for the one on the obstacle, where it's foot's placed on the obstacle, are not significantly different from uniform terrain locomotion. And what changes is that its leg posture is, is altered when it lands on the obstacle, so it's in a more crouched posture with a shallow contact angle. Um, and it ends up doing positive work on that obstacle step. But uh, so that, that on the obstacle step, there seems to be some feedback that results in a response um, to stabilize the body center mass. But then it quickly recovers so that once it's one step after the obstacle, it's back to its level steady state trajectory. And what these initial studies um, revealed to me is the importance of that stance swing transition. That the main different, that the, the animals were able to run with very um, extended or crouched leg postures as a re result of terrain perturbations. And that posture was influenced by, because they, they lift their legs relatively high during the swing phase, they swing them forward and then they retract them backwards while they extend their legs. And the posture is influenced by the timing of con ground contact. So when they, they contact the ground a little bit early because of a, an obstacle, they're in a more crouched posture. And when it's late because of a hole, they have more extended posture. And so that, that got me interested in understanding the control of swing link dynamics and how that influences um, robustness and stability in uneven terrain. Um, but it's been, this late swing leg retraction is not something that I was the first to observe. This was uh, noted before by Andre Seyfarth and, and others to occur in human locomotion, and also it's, it's been noted in quadrupeds. Um, basically, that this leg retraction and late swing improves stability by automatically adjusting contact angle with small terrain perturbations. But what these previous studies and my earlier studies did not really address is how fast should the leg be retracted? Um, we know that some mild leg retraction is stabilizing, but we don't know how fast exactly to retract the leg. And a little bit of um, modeling reveals that there's a trade-off between um, terrain robustness in terms of the maximum terrain perturbation that an animal can um, negotiate without missing stance and falling versus injury avoidance. Um, so if, 
an animal uses relatively low leg retraction velocity, this allows it to negotiate a larger drop because it will actually be able to make stands. If it's retracting the leg too fast, it misses stands completely, and then that results into a, in a fall. But with a low leg retraction velocity, the vertical velocity of the body center of mass when contact is finally made is higher. And so this results in larger force fluctuations with terrain perturbations. But with a high, rate, high leg retraction velocity, what happens is ground contact is made sooner um, because the, the leg is basically uh, retracted so that it contacts the ground in a more upright posture. And this minimizes the force fluctuations, but it also means that the maximum drop that the animal can encounter before it completely misses stance is reduced. So there's a little bit of a trade-off here, and we didn't really know what do animals prioritize. Do they prioritize not missing stance, or do they prioritize minimizing force fluctuations, which might result in injury? Um, but we also noted that compliant legs relax this trade-off. So small animals might run with compliant legs because perhaps they're more, um, they're more selective for stability um, against in really rough terrain. Um, compliant legs result in you being able to negotiate a larger drop with lower force fluctuations without um, having to worry about this leg retraction velocity trade-off quite as much. So when we got interested in the swing leg control problem and how animals might adjust their swing leg control for different perturbation types, we started exploring different types of perturbations. So the initial perturbation was an unexpected pothole, so a single step down. And we were wondering whether animals use a similar strategy if it's a permanent step down. And so this is a video from some work um, with Yvonne Bloom and our collaborators at Oregon State University, Jonathan Hurst and his graduate students. Um, and basically this bird is, the, the data I'm gonna show you is actually a case where the, the terrain is all black uniformly, um, but we don't really see significant difference based on whether it's a high or co low contrast um, condition. It's just encountering, I think this is a six centimeter drop. That's right, okay. And basically looking at whether they use a similar swing leg, swing leg policy um, when they encounter this situation. So these are traces of the leg angular trajectory um, during these conditions. So here we've got a uniform level terrain average for comparison um, on the far left there. And then we have steps, the negative one step is the one just before the, the drop. Uh, the zero step is the, the actual drop step itself. And then plus one step is the one just after that. And what we see is that the leg angular trajectory does not change throughout that perturbation. It's very consistent. So the leg angular tra trajectory seems to be controlled in a very, um, it's, it's robust against perturbations. And so maybe it's a feed forward trajectory. Um, the leg length trajectory, on the other hand, is more variable. So the leg, the stance phase, the stance phases are in gray, I think I forgot to mention, but the stance phases um, in blue for the, the stance leg and uh, in the gray bars here for the actual stance duration, you can see that the leg is extended somewhat in the drop step. And so it's extended its leg toward the ground in, when it encounters this drop perturbation a little bit. So it has a more extended uh, leg. But then in the stance just after that, it's gone back to its regular leg posture. So we see more variation in the leg length trajectories than in the leg angular trajectories. Um, and what's, I think, really impressive is that through this perturbation, you really have a hard time noticing any difference in the peak vertical ground reaction force during this perturbation. So these traces are the, so the red traces are the, um, actually in this case it's the axial leg force, so it's the, the force directed in the, in the direction of the leg. Um, it's very similar to the vertical ground reaction force. What we see is that the peak force is very similar across these um, step categories. And what happens is similar to the pothole case, in the, in the actual perturbed step, um, the, the leg, the leg contact angle is adjusted just because, the, because of the longer flight phase with the drop, and it accelerates forward. Um, so there's a reorientation of the ground reaction force, and then in the step afterwards, it starts to decelerate itself again. Once it it's, continues along this lower ground level, 
it starts to absorb energy. So the first step following that perturbation is exactly like the unexpected drop perturbation. So when they first encounter the perturbation, they use a similar intrinsic mechanical response, um, automatically accelerating forward through the adjustment of the leg contact angle. And then if they continue at the new ground level, then they start to absorb energy to adjust at the, to the new conditions. So uh, for some further analysis of the potential control policies that we could implement um, to, to achieve this constant ground reaction force, you should go see the posters um, later in the conference by Yvonne <coughs> Fulman and Kamen uh, Badani. Um, and they, because they're, they're looking at feed forward leg angle control policies that can achieve constant peak vertical force or constant peak leg force. So another set of experiments we've done is to investigate um, whether animals change their control strategy depending on how rough the terrain is. So in the previous experiments, we just had one obstacle height that we were investigating. In this case, um, we were looking at a range of obstacle heights from 10% of leg length up to 50% of leg length. And I'll have to speed up a little bit here to get through it. Um, so this is a pheasant encountering a, an obstacle that's about 50% of its leg length. What we find is remarkably that they don't slow down at all during these, and we have a hard time measuring things that actually do change, in fact. So when we actually look at the leg trajectories, in this case, leg length is on top. Um, here I'm just showing the, the obstacle step. The leg is a bit more crouched, but the leg ang angular trajectory, again, does not change um, significantly or measurably from what we measure during the informed terrain. And if we look at approaching the obstacle, stepping onto it, and back down again, um, we see that some changes in the leg length. So it basically uh, launches itself up toward the obstacle by actuating the leg in the stance approaching the obstacle. On the obstacle step, though, it's very similar to uniform terrain. And then it extends its leg a little bit as it goes down from the obstacle. So there's some change in leg length um, to, to basically minimize the disturbance to the center of mass trajectory. But the leg angular trajectory, again, looks nearly identical. And they maintain similar ground reaction forces throughout this perturbation. So even from, for, for obstacles as big as 50% of leg length, they maintain similar ground reaction forces. So quickly, I'll just show a few videos of doing the same experiment from quail to ostriches. Um, this is mostly for fun and future discussion during the meeting. This is a bobwhite quail. We had to create different setups for each animal, of course, because they scale so differently. Um, the, the quail can negotiate obstacles up to 80% of its leg length without really substantially show, slowing down. So they're really quite amazing at this. This is a wild turkey. Uh, negotiating a, an obstacle that's of relatively similar size. And this is an ostrich that was seven months old. I don't yet have the, uh, the videos for the full-grown ostriches because we just collected it about a month ago. I've been busy with other things. So this is a seven-month-old ostrich negotiating it. We couldn't get the ostriches in the lab to negotiate obstacles bigger than about 10% of the leg length. But I don't think that actually has anything to do with their actual ability. It's just that they were a little skittish and um, hard to handle in the, in the lab. <laughs> but what we observed is across the different animals and terrain um, obstacle heights, uh, if we measured the maximum peak force that we observed throughout the, ter the obstacle terrain compared to what they do for the mean of level terrain, it never exceeds 40% higher than what they would have we observed in the uniform level terrain. So they maintain constant peak forces throughout these perturbation types. Um, but I just want to show this one last video to show that they can get it wrong if they don't see it coming and the obstacle is too big. So this is a turkey encountering that um, an obscure obstacle. And it's big enough that it nearly misses stance. And what you can see is in that drop step, the peak forces are very reduced, and then they nearly double in the step afterwards to compensate. So if they don't see it coming, 
they can get large fluctuations in force. So we think this is actively controlled to, to maintain constant peak force. So I'll skip the summary because I think I'm out of time and just let people go ahead and ask questions. We see large fluctuations in body height, but with low fluctuations in force. Well, so they're <laughs> when they're encountering the, um, the the terrain perturbations, the force is the the the, for, the magnitude of the force in the leg length direction remains relatively constant, and, but it's redirected so that they basically they'll they're they're. It's, Converting between potential and kinetic energy, accelerating themselves upward, and, and um, so they'll be convert kinetic energy to potential energy and be higher on the obstacle, and then convert kinetic energy to potential energy back down from the obstacle. And the force um, is oriented differently, but the magnitude of the force in the leg leg direction remains relatively constant. The leg force, okay. Uh, Um, what kind, the, the whole center? Uh, we, we can estimate it, but I mean, we can, we have to make some assumptions there because we, we can't account for things, we don't have a detailed model to account for internal work done um, to basically accelerate the segments and things like that. So he's, he's asking if we have um, estimates of the work done by the leg. Uh, so we do, if we assume a fairly simple model, we can estimate for example, the work done um, if we model it as a slip model, for example. So we can estimate the amount of energy, you know, the energy absorption and production during that, that bouncing weight. And that did not change all that much? Well, that's a, yeah, I didn't have time to go into the details of that. It does change some, actually, yes. So they, they do um, do actuate the leg in particular circumstances, and that's something that varies with terrain condition more. So um, when they can anticipate the obstacle, they tend to do positive work in advance of the obstacle in, with their legs, and then um, on the actual obstacle step, it's relatively steady, and then they absorb energy when they go back down. So they do tend to, they, they do absorb and produce energy with the legs under various circumstances, but it's not as consistent across terrain conditions. All right, what's the question? Uh, actually, I have three questions, so just oh. cut me off. <laughs> okay. so, Pick uh, one. The yes. first one is, uh, so Mark Pine with the, and the group, uh, those ideas of heat sensitivity norm is a measure of robustness, and it's kind of cool that your experiment is a little bit like what they like to do with robots, which is to accept out the surface. And then uh, they use things like the auto time states or the uh, step frequency to settle back to the state. Yeah. And Um, I don't have probably the exact calculations that would be comparable to, to those, but I do know from the studies that um, the gate dynamics are not, me are not measurably different from, from uniform terrain from within once you get to the step two. So they've completely recovered by step two. Um, how much time that takes depends on the, the bird and how fast it's going and things. But, uh, basically, it tends to be two step cycles to recover pretty consistently. Okay, I think it would be interesting to try to fit an exponential to that to see if it is exponential, and then maybe there would be a time constant where you know two might be the time constant, and then <laughs> the third step should still have a little bit of residual. Um, yeah, and the problem though is the noisiness of experimental data. It's always hard. I mean, because we do always have a lot of variation. We can't control how fast the birds are going. We have variation in speed. And so we always have to take averages of the data across you know, lots of birds and lots of trials. And so I always wonder what the best approach is for calculating such time constants with such noisy data. But that's something I'd like to, certainly like to discuss. Okay, so another thing I was wondering is that uh, you, you said something about feed forward You're right. 
I don't actually know. That's a that's a, a point of interpretation. I have the observation that the um, the force that the the peak forces in the leg length direction are relatively constant, but um, and I have the observation that the leg angular, angular trajectory is relatively constant. How that's actually controlled is I don't really know. So um, I it can be achieved with a simple feed forward control policy, but that doesn't mean that that's how animals are achieving it because it can certainly be achieved other ways as well. Okay, uh, one, last question. In working with the birds, <clears throat> excuse me, you showed us the videos that sort of captured the ideal step over, especially with the uh, anticipated obstacles. Did they tend to use the same sort of gait to cross the obstacle each time? And uh, the, the video that motivated this was the turkey going over. Uh, he actually jumped to a, a two uh, legs in the air flight phase at one point. None of the other birds seemed to do that. So what was your uh, intuitive feel? Did they tend to use the same step over foot placement and pattern every time, or did they change it? Um, I would actually have to ask my PhD student because she's actually had her eyeballs on the, every single uh -huh. trial a little bit more than I have. So I can really only tell you based on what she's told me that it, um, it seems to be relatively random, that they, they tend to use fairly different approach step strategies. And sometimes they appear to be kind of skipping as they go back down so that you see different patterns. Sometimes they stumble a little bit when they're approaching, so they might not lift their legs and actually reach full clearance, so they'll stumble a little bit. But overall, um, so it seems that they don't necessarily target particular stepping patterns um, as much as they uh, basically, during the stance phase before, they would launch themselves up really high into the air to allow them plenty of time to adjust their leg posture as they're approaching that obstacle. Well, thank you very much, Monica. Uh